Hello, everybody. Uh, I am here in Stores, Connecticut. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank University of Connecticut to give us the opportunity uh, to make this interview with our first keynote speaker, Professor Joseph Renzulli. And uh, this interview is relating to the uh, capacity building conference, which will take place in Antalya, Turkey. So I am very happy to meet with you, Joe, today in order to make uh, this interview. I'm very happy to be here, my dear friend. Thank you. So we will go uh, over the questions we already uh, wrote for this interview. First of all, can you please tell us in brief about your childhood? I had a, a very interesting childhood. Um, my father died when I was eight years of age, and uh, my mother was left with three children and, and very few resources. And um, so we all had to figure out how to survive. Uh, if we wanted something, if I wanted a new pair of sneakers or if I wanted 20 cents to go to the movies, I had to figure out a way to get that. And so I think that that is probably where a little bit of my uh, motivation and my entrepreneurialism came from. And did anyone consider you as a gifted child and a young adult? I don't think anyone ever thought of me that way. In fact, in many cases, I was always told, uh, why wasn't I as smart as my older brother? Uh, but people did think I was rather clever in being able to solve problems. Again, starting little businesses and uh, figuring out how to raise money or uh, get some people to cooperate on a project seemed to be uh, more along the lines of my skills, uh, whereas my brother was just a very, very brilliant young man, and if there had been gifted programs around at the time, he certainly would have been first in line for them. And um, were your teachers responsive to, your, uh, <coughs> to you in school? For example, in other words, have you had a good experiences with your teachers at schools and instructors at, you know, uh, at university also? Well, I, a couple of teachers were very, very influential in my school life. Um, my seventh grade teacher um, knew that I was uh, in trouble a lot, and uh, I was sitting on the detention bench outside of uh, the principal's office one day, and she sat down next to me and started complimenting me on some of the things that I had written for uh, her English class. And she said, uh, you really like to write and you're a pretty good writer. Would you like to start a school newspaper? And you could do some writing for that and you could get involved with other people. And um, this probably was the very first realization of something that would come later in my work, which was what I call type three enrichment. Um, so she was very influential and helped me a lot uh, with my writing and with organizing and developing the newspaper. It was called the Oak Leaf. Our school was called Oakhurst Grammar School. Uh, the second teacher was my eighth grade teacher. Um, her name was Roberta Mamula. And um, when the guidance counselor from the high school tried to direct me into a vocational track, uh, because, again, of the circumstances of our family, she said, don't listen to her. Take the college prep track. You're very clever, and you will find a way to go to college. And uh, had it not been for that, uh, I would not have been prepared uh, to go to college. Um, many of my college professors and later graduate school professors were also uh, influences on uh, the kind of work that I later developed um, my interest in research and uh, my interest in uh, giftedness and creativity really came from many of the professors that I worked with over the years. Uh, did you ever look for a mentor? And who were your mentor? Um, I didn't exactly go looking for mentors as much as following people because of their work who then later became mentors and friends. Um, I think that um, some of the most important ones were uh, Paul Torrance, uh, Virgil Ward, Jim Gallagher, Harry Passau, Dorothy Sisk. And then even some of my students became mentors in the sense that they knew things 
that I didn't know. Uh, for example, uh, Alexenia Baldwin mm -hmm. and Mary Frazier were two of the people that introduced me to the issue of looking for and developing uh, talent in minority and underrepresented groups. And uh, Sally Reese, a former student, uh, also got me involved in the application of my work in schools and how we could uh, modify that work and improve upon it. And uh, subsequently, it was through her influence that uh, we together developed the school-wide enrichment model. I was so happy with that relationship that we eventually got married. Oh, this is nice. <laughs> At what point in your life did you know that you wanted to be a scholar? And now the most famous and well-known scholar. It, it, it's difficult to say, but there were certainly a few things that influenced me. Uh, one of them was um, when uh, I was in a master's degree program in school psychology at Rutgers University, and my uh, advisor uh, asked me to read a manuscript that she was supposed to review for a uh, book company. And it was uh, a wonderful book called uh, Creativity and Giftedness by uh, Getzels and Jackson. And uh, that really opened up my ideas uh, about these two concepts and how they interrelated with one another. And uh, after that, uh, just dozens of questions popped into my mind about how it could be investigated and still are popping into my mind today. I don't think that a week goes by that I don't get an idea for what will be another research study that I'm convinced will change the world. We know, uh, Joe, that how much you are busy, especially you know you and Sally. And uh, I have like a question relating to how you could make a balance between your work life and your family life? It's always difficult to, uh, to achieve that balance and because Sally and I are in the same field, uh, a lot of our work life and family life interact. But we do set time aside that is just for family. Uh, we have children and we have grandchildren and we just set that time aside and computers are turned off and cell phones are turned off and we do things with our family uh, and um, we spend time with them uh, in the summer after our summer institute. And uh, I think you really have to plan and program those kinds of times with as much thought as you give to planning your work or else your work will overwhelm you. Yeah. Um, what skills do you think have been important to your success? I think that um, Probably the main one is uh, curiosity. Um, uh, I'm curious about lots and lots of things, and I follow up on some of them that are even outside of my field. But I think being curious uh, is uh, certainly something that's always guided me to the next step, which is uh, examination, uh, research studies, creativity, and innovation. And uh, then the third thing is energy. Um, many people have lots and lots of good ideas, but it takes time and it takes energy to follow through on those ideas. And so I think that those three things taken together uh, really are the things that uh, allowed me to do the work that I've done over the years. What motivates you to enter this field of knowledge? What, what is the motivation or what motivates you to enter this field of knowledge? Well, I think that when I began teaching, uh, a couple of things happened uh, simultaneously. Uh, one was that I had young people in my class that I knew were not being challenged by the regular curriculum and that they were going to be bored if I didn't find some things for them to do that would be more uh, interesting and engaging, um, really set the basis for what I now build a lot of my work around, which I call the three E's, enjoyment, which leads to engagement, which leads to enthusiasm for learning. I had to do something different with these young people. And the second thing was um, that 
when I began teaching, uh, the Russians fired this little basketball-sized thing into the air, which is called Sputnik. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a science and mathematics teacher. And the superintendent of schools came to me and said, um, would you be interested in developing something in science for our most uh, capable students in that area? And so that's really what got me started on my career in gifted education. And what kind of major challenges uh, do you fa did you face in this uh, field? Well, what I thought was a major challenge actually turned out to be a major advantage. And um, there was no quote unquote curriculum for the gifted available at that time. And if there were some books with gifted science on the cover, I probably would have taught that material. And um, so what I had to do actually is to create experiences that were not part of any plan prescribed uh, curriculum. And again, I think that these are where the very early ideas of the triad model uh, came into being. Uh, having speakers come in and talk about their work in a scientific area, uh, helping kids to develop the skills that would allow them to investigate that work and then uh, having them work on a project that they might enter in the state science fair or a robotics contest or a writing opportunity, uh, a history day competition. All of those kinds of things um, really were my movement against the pres plan prescribed curriculum, uh, which even at a very advanced level still deals with a kind of pedagogy that is opposite from an uh, investigative, uh, innovative, creative pedagogy that uh, I would like to believe characterizes uh, my main focus in my work. But in addition to that, we know that you already created uh, multiple criteria, identification and the screening process, which justifies that we can have uh, like a comprehensive profile for each child and then Based on that, we can introduce, you know, special provisions like a school-wide enrichment model and so on. Yes, I think that probably one of the most important contributions uh, was my 1978 article called What Makes Giftedness? Reexamining a Definition, where I said that, yes, uh, high achievement, high intelligence is important, but the people who history remembers as gifted contributors and I always use the word as an adjective, not a noun, were people that also blended in uh, the uh, uh, characteristics that I describe in the creativity circle and in the task commitment circle. Um, just having a, a high academic ability is obviously a great asset, but without the other two clusters of traits, creativity and task commitment, interacting with ability and with each other, we're not going to see the kinds of contributions that literally have changed the world. And I believe it's experiences that approximate those change the world types of thinking and innovation that should be the focus of a gifted program. Yes, advanced placement and advanced courses are important, but it's the application of knowledge that really has made important gains in the social, scientific, economic realms of uh, mankind. And that's why I believe the focus of our field should be in that area, not just advanced courses. And um, as we know that you become uh, internationally involved in gifted education in different countries and most of your books, most of your research studies and models are already introduced in other cultures and in different languages? Well, I think that there are, are two reasons for that. And one was that um, early on, as my work uh, grew in popularity, uh, I was invited by uh, Professor Franz Monks to come and lecture in Europe, which I did uh, during a sabbatical year. An interesting footnote to that is that uh, three Dutch economists just did a follow-up study, a 25-year follow-up study of a school that I started in Holland with remarkable results for 
all of the kinds of successful characteristics of the students that were in that school. Uh, so uh, certainly Dr. Monks was influential. The second person that was influential was you. Uh, Thank you. Your worldview and especially uh, the work that you've done in Europe and the Middle East was influential in your um, arrangements that you made for me to speak in Europe, in the Middle East, and other places. And so I think that that's how work gets spread around. Somebody locally has to see the value of work that was done in America or any other country, for that matter, as benefiting uh, children in different parts of the world. Thank you, Joe. What about talent development with underachievers or underachieving uh, and at-risk children uh, and youth uh, based on the important uh, work you did in uh, this area? Well, <coughs> I, I think that this is uh, really very important because the talent pool of the world probably includes 10 times as many under underachieving minority underrepresented students as the what we typically think as let's call it our college going population and um, these people are oftentimes overlooked because they don't score well on traditional tests but many of them have outstanding characteristics in creativity in motivation in task commitment uh, what people today are calling grit i've referred to it early on as task commitment. And um, we need the, the human capital from the entire population of the world to continue to make the world a better place. Uh, there's lots of challenges that we face in the world today, in politics, in industry, in business, in environment, in, in uh, peacefulness and social relations between peoples and countries. And it's going to take lots and lots of human creativity and ideas and talent to address those problems. We can't overlook people because they happen to uh, be uh, from a poor background or speak languages that are different from the minority language. We have to look into those populations for our talent reservoir. And how could we convince politicians? I think it's very hard to convince politicians of something like that. But I do think that uh, research studies that show the uh, accomplishments that can be carried out with groups of uh, different backgrounds uh, is important. And then just case studies. When we talk about people who have faced great obstacles and, and tragedies, uh, but have gone on to do very, very important things. Uh, the person that invented the artificial heart was considered to be a failure, was rejected from every medical school that he applied to, had to go out of country to get a medical education. Uh, Nelson Mandela, who spent a majority of his career in prison and it was one of the persons that created the probably the best known bloodless revolution that ever took place in the world. Um, St uh, Steven Spielberg, who his world-renowned filmmaker. School was very, very difficult for him. He was considered to be a problem a child, an underachiever. His mother and his teachers and even psychiatrists said, you know, that there's something wrong with this, this young man. And today he's made some of the most beautiful movies that ever existed. So I think that we have to just dig a little harder beyond just looking at traditional measures such as achievement tests or aptitude tests or IQ tests to find these kinds of talents. Yes. Does the feeling of beauty have any role in creativity? Absolutely. I, I think that the purpose of human productivity is either efficiency, that we make things that work better and serve people better, or that make our world a more beautiful place. What do we honor from the ancient world? We honor the artwork even going back to ancient civilizations, we uh, honor the uh, paintings, the sculpting, the literature, and uh, all of those things. And I, I think that sometimes in a kind of a economically driven uh, frame of mind, we forget the importance of making the world a more beautiful place. And I think that every gifted program should pay as much attention to 
aesthetic and artistic development as it does to academic development. And this implies that creativity has very important role in different sectors of life. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, creativity is important in every walk of life, from playing around with something, a recipe you're working on in the kitchen for your dinner this evening, to thinking about a way of solving the massive traffic problems that face every city of the world. Creativity enters all of those things. That implies that how could we invest in the young generation in order to produce the future innovators, the future creators? Well, again, I, I think that our major investment in the younger generation should focus on what I refer to as creative productivity and an investigative frame of mind. I think that we want young people to look at situations and say, how can that be improved? What can be done to make that more beautiful? What can it be done to make that more efficient, to save time, to save money? And those are some of the kinds of things that in highly ministry-controlled education uh, systems don't make room for. Many of those systems just simply want to do everything possible to raise the scores on achievement tests. And I will never argue against the value of that. But what I'm saying is that we need to have some balance between an academic progress frame of mind and a creative investigative frame of mind. As a creative scholar, where do your best ideas come from? My best ideas come from watching something in practice that is very exciting, that seems to be having a positive effect, and that might be the basis for a research study to find out if either that's the magic of the one teacher I saw doing it, or can we replicate that in other teachers? In science, people usually think theory leads to research, leads to practice, and I believe that's backwards. I believe that practice leads to research, and if it works out well, then it can be blended into the theory. In my work, theories always come last, and what has come in the middle is researching whether or not a practice is replicable and what other things that I didn't even know might be there are the result of that research. And do you think this is why your uh, models intro which were introduced by you and Sally uh, were more uh, successful than other models? Yes, I, I think that um, the practicality of our work is really what one of the two things that has made it so successful. The other thing being the teacher training that we've provided yes. uh, through our Summer Institute, Confertute, and training that we've done in, in schools and for ministries around the world. Uh, if it doesn't work well in the hands and eyes of teachers, it's probably not a good idea. So we always start with practice and grow it outward from there. And will you please uh, give us a brief idea or a brief introduction about Confratute? Because I think it is the um, most popular, well-structured uh, teacher training program. Yes, Confratute is uh, going into its 41st year. And I think that um, one of the reasons it's successful, again, is because it is not professors giving lectures about what teachers should do but it's teachers that are doing great things that are demonstrating that uh, for our participants. Uh, over the years, we've uh, had probably 35 plus thousand people that have attended Confertute. We don't have exact numbers because yes. many people have come back over several years. Yes. But I think it is um, the fact that uh, we're not uh, telling them how to do it, but showing them how it is done. Uh, one of my favorite quotations is that uh, example is the best teaching of mankind and they will learn from no others. And so seeing practitioners in practice is really what has made uh, Confertute so successful. And how could we achieve excellence in gifted education 
in particular and uh, any educational system in general? Well, I, I think that the way to achieve excellence <coughs> is to, first of all, realize that schools are places for talent development. Yes, there is basic material, vocabulary, and mathematics, and functions, and equations that are important for young people. But if we look at a school the way a conservatory looks at a young musician coming in, or a um, place that uh, trains chefs looks at them as persons that they are going to make into world-class Michelin-related chefs, and follow their pedagogy a little bit more than just the pedagogy where we present material, children memorize it, they get ready, they take a test, and we move on to the next topic. And I believe that, that our work in school-wide enrichment model and the enrichment triad model has said something like this, information itself has no value. Thinking skills themselves have no value until we put them together to use them on some project, research project, some theater production, some musical composition, some uh, fiction or non-fiction uh, writing. All of those things suddenly have value when we see that there is a purpose. And that's why when children say school is boring and they say it's irrelevant, it's because we haven't given them enough opportunities to put their knowledge and their thinking skills to work into something that is meaningful to them. Yes, and I remember, Joe, in 1990s when you were introducing uh, curriculum compacting, differentiation, all types of differentiation, it was the first attempts at the, at the international level because, you know, at the very beginning of the 21st century, we were talking about productive thinking and thinking skills, but you were talking about this nearly in the 1990s. Yeah, it takes a long, yeah. it takes a long time yes. for an idea to take hold. Yes. And uh, I think that I'm so happy that our work, although it has its roots in gifted education, is now being adapted and adopted in many places in general education. I think the gifted field should be proud of the fact that we've had a major influence in making schools uh, better places for all young people, not just children that have been uh, formally identified as gifted. Uh, you know, we have different approaches when we talk about programs for the gifted. For example, some people asking me, you know, Joran Zuli always talking about uh, serving the gifted in the regular classroom or in the regular school. And then I say, okay, there is another trend that we have special schools for the gifted. Then they are asking, you know, about advantages and disadvantages between, you know, when we make comparison, comparison between these two approaches. Well, I, I believe in what we sometimes refer to in our work as a continuum of services. And that continuum ranges from providing different kinds of enrichment and acceleration activities. Acceleration in our model we do individually through curriculum compacting, but that we provide those in regular classrooms. But if we have a group of students that have a very strong interest in, let's say, doing an environmental study about uh, pollution in local in a local stream or the need to recycle uh, uh, garbage or, or waste products, then that becomes a focus group. In our model, we call those enrichment clusters. And so all of those kids are coming together because of the commonality of the interest and the commitment to do something about that interest. So we go from the general classroom to a smaller focus group. And then we have some children who are extremely advanced in a particular area, and they might go into uh, something like a specialized high school, like Bronx High School of Science, or they might go into an advanced class in science at their own high school, as long, in my opinion, it has opportunities for creative productivity, not just learning AP science to take a test. Yes. So a continuum of services means various types from what happens in a regular classroom to what happens at a conservatory for musicians or a science, uh, a special high school for science or a special high school for arts and theater and everything in between. 
Uh, and I do think that um, at the elementary and uh, middle school levels that we should be doing things in the regular classroom and in enrichment clusters. In high schools, we should have some special opportunities, the seminars that are based on our enrichment cluster pedagogy so that young people are together using the kind of pedagogy uh, that I've talked about uh, in an investigative, uh, a creative investigative type of pedagogy. You are always careful about, you know, uh, the uh, resources which might be available for teachers. And I do remember at the beginning of uh, the, tooth, uh, the year 2000, you were encouraging people to produce, you know, materials for the teachers to be ready. And then you were up to date and then you, inv uh, you invested and employed the technology in a good way. And then you come up with uh, a unique system. We call it Renzuli Learning System. So will you please give us a brief idea about what the system all about, what are the main functions and features of this system? You know, the Renzulli Learning System was something that um, Sally Reese and I developed out of necessity. And when I say out of necessity, we realize that the kind of pedagogy that we are advocating, recognizing students' strengths and interests, and providing them with lots of resources to promote those strengths and interests couldn't be done without the effective use of technology. And so we developed a system where we create a profile for each individual child that looks at their academic strengths, their interests. Interests are so important to anybody doing anything important. Yes. Their learning styles and their preferred modes of expression. And that's all done electronically, and it produces a profile which is then read by a search engine that scans each individual child's profile, and it finds resources just for that young person based on their individual profile. So it's really unique. No one else has yet come up yes. with anything like that. I think that it ha its greatest value may also be in allowing teachers to search any given topic that they're studying and find high engagement resources. All of our resources are very hands-on. Children can build their own roller coaster or dissect and preserve their own mummy. Uh, they can uh, do all kinds of interesting things virtually from this, these online uh, resources that we've gathered from around the world. And now that system is also being made available in m all of the languages of the world. Originally, it was only available in English, and now we're adapting it through artificial intelligence so that it can be translated virtually into any language. And I think that you can't do the kind of teaching that personalizes learning, especially with advanced level resources, unless you have quick and easy access to, I think there's 50,000 resources yes. in the databases of Renzulli Learning. And that's gonna pick resources just for a given child or if a teacher wants to infuse some enrichment into her or his classroom, it will find those resources. And most of them are come from places like museums, libraries of Congress, professional, uh, organizations and most of them are free and you know it is also a very flexible system because you know if i would like to reproduce uh, things like virtual uh, visits for example how to box uh, thinking skills activities so teachers have the templates and the tools to reproduce things which are available or will be available in their own languages yeah i do think that uh, making things available in uh, more languages. Um, one of the features of our expanded program into uh, several languages is that uh, people can upload various kinds of activities in whatever language they would like into the system, and uh, that's good. And we will do as much as possible to encourage them to upload again advanced level high engagement activities rather than just textual material. 
And did the system allows the teachers, for example, to do follow-up or parents, for example, to follow up their uh, students? Yes, it allows teachers to do many things. Teachers can, for example, form groups of students based on a commonality of interest or a commonality of learning style yes. or a commonality of expression style. And um, sometimes you need everybody with that particular focus and sometimes you need combinations thereof. Teachers can send activities, they can name individual students or name yes. groups and send certain activities to one, group one or certain activities to group two. So. The, there's just a marvelous flexibility in the way teachers can use the system. And as one teacher said when we were uh, uh, first doing research on this, it's like having a dozen teaching assistants in my classroom every day, all day, because it performs all of these resources. So we're very proud of the system. And I think you have research-based information or evidence that this system is efficient and effective you know, to be used and invested in in the school. Yes, a number of articles, research articles, uh, have been uh, uh, conducted, uh, studies have been conducted uh, on the system. It improves achievement, which most administrators are still concerned with, but it also shows a, a large extent and variety of creative productivity that has resulted from using the system. And I'm, I'm happy that it improves achievement because whether we like it or not, that is still what most administrators and what most ministries of education are using to judge the effectiveness of our schools. Yes. How difficult is to pursue research uh, career now compared to when you started or even just a couple of decades ago? Well, research has become a little bit more difficult in present days because of uh, the, uh, the uh, bureaus the, uh, that uh, look at who you're asking questions and what you're asking questions of. Uh, IRBs, uh, in, uh, they're called at university level. And a lot more paperwork, a lot more approval, a lot more guaranteeing the safety and the an anonymity of young people. Um, the good news is that there are so many more research tools available through the use of the internet. Uh, we can now send a questionnaire to 10,000 people around the country and around the world in many different languages with a push of a button, whereas years ago, all of those things had to be reproduced and translated and sent through the mail and all of that. So re research is changing uh, for the better because of the availability of technology. One of the latest developments took place at, at Connecticut University is the establishment of Renzuli uh, Center. Will you please uh, shed some light on this uh, development? Well, uh, we were originally um, sponsored by a, a grant from uh, uh, Ray and Carol Niag uh, that uh, the center was named after them. They later uh, gave our School of Education a very large grant so that we became the NEAG School of Education. And uh, last year, uh, at a birthday celebration uh, for me, they came as guests and at that time announced that uh, since the School of Education was now named after them, that they would like to have the center named after me. And so that's how we became uh, the Renzulli Center for uh, Creativity, Gifted Education, and Talent Development. Obviously, I'm very pleased and flattered and was very surprised and grateful for the fact that uh, Ray and Carol were so willing to do that. Do you have any advice for young researchers? Uh, besides um, learning all of the kinds of skills that allow them to do the most sophisticated research possible, I think that they should always approach a research project with this question. Will it have influence on the consumer of our work? And the consumers to me are always teachers and 
young people in classrooms, whether they're in primary classrooms or college level classrooms, that there's a lot of research that's done these days that is just basically number counting and we find out how many children in different groups get free and reduced lunch and what the average salary is for teachers and how many hours per week children spend or don't spend in a gifted program. And that research can't hurt anybody. It's just that it doesn't help a teacher who's trying to make his or her classroom a happier place, enjoyment always comes first, a more engaging place, and a place where children view learning as the exciting process that it is. Again, what I call the three E's. I think that uh, whenever someone approaches me about ideas for research, I give them that advice that it, the end consumer has to be the person that can benefit it from, not just the fact that we can put a bunch of numbers on a table and say we did a research project. Yeah, very true. What do you think will be the next breakthrough uh, or hot area in gifted education? Well, I think that there are uh, a couple of things that are going to be uh, hot areas. And, and one is that um, we can translate our interest in reaching more underrepresented and minority groups and children who just think differently, that we can get better at doing that through uh, various kinds of assessment tools and techniques. And uh, we all believe that that's a major goal. And I would say right now, the largest issue facing the field of gifted education. And um, I do think that the next step has to be the practical part of that. All right, what can we do to make sure that a child who may even have a learning disability, but is it one of the most creative kids that ever walked down in, through the door of the school? How can we find that child and serve that child well? That's the direction that I think uh, some of our research should take. The other thing is, um, the use of artificial intelligence is now just in its very early stages. Uh, one of our colleagues, um, in fact, has developed a uh, creativity test b based on artificial intelligence, which is the first test of its kind that can be scored electronically. Uh, the biggest problem with creativity tests has been that they need to be scored by humans because you can't, a, can't make a choice A, B, C, D, or all of the above. Yes, yes. Uh, and so um, the work of uh, this person uh, is going to be a giant step forward because now creativity will be more objectively measured in an economic fashion than it has been in the, in the past. And uh, I'm happy to say that we're going to be blending that creativity test into the Renzulli learning system, uh, which will make it, again, a one, of, one of a kind in the world. And this will extend also the profile. Yes, the profile will be extended greatly. Yes. Uh, at the end of this interview, I would like you to conclude uh, this interview by some recommendations, suggestions to the participants of this conference and the people in general. Well, I, I think that conferences are great places to become exposed to uh, different uh, people, uh, different ideas, and different approaches to serving uh, gifted education, to serving general education. I think that um, one has to look at those things in relationship to how can it benefit their work, whether they're a teacher, whether they're an administrator, they work in a ministry of education. How can this make a change? The second thing I recommend is that they have to examine, let's call it the validity of that work. When someone comes up to me and says, uh, I have a, a new model for gifted education, and I look at the model, and I certainly pay attention to the model, but what I finally ask them is, are there two or three or five or 10 schools that I can go to and see this model in action. Yes. Uh, and I believe that uh, we can always make one perfect laboratory setting uh, about that model, but 
that's everything is concentrated. Is it replicable? And that's why I don't want to see just one school. I want to see three or four or a half a dozen schools that are using the model. Uh, the quote that I mentioned earlier, example is the best school of mankind and they will learn it new other, no other. I think I have to see it in action. And then I can say, wow, that's really doing some great things for kids. And I am happy to recommend that. But the first thing I would recommend is for people to go and visit it. You have to see it in action. And that's one of the reasons with our school-wide enrichment model, somebody can call me from any state in the United States or a number of places around the world. And I can give them the name of somebody's school that they can go to and visit and see it in action. After that, they can learn the how-to. How can we do this in our own school? And one of the things that I'm proudest about in our school-wide enrichment model is that we have common goals, the three E's that I mentioned earlier. But I want people to use their own imagination and curiosity and initiative to shape and mold the program in their own way because if you don't have ownership, it will not last. Yes. As long as you reach the three E's at the end of the line, if, and that's the way I will get I new, new ideas. I will then recommend those ideas. Here's something that they did at a school in, in Chile that I think is a great idea that other people can benefit from. Or here's something that happened in a school in Jordan or in Dubai or in Germany or in France that can be shared with other people. And that's one of the things that we do at Confitude, by the way. We have people coming from all over the world yes. to share their successful ideas. And we all benefit from that. Yes. So thank you so much, Joe, for this interview. It is really very impressive. We highly appreciate your contributions to this field of uh, knowledge. And we wish you a happy, healthy, long life. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. It's been my great pleasure and my great honor to be here. And I love this work and will hopefully have many, many more years before me to continue it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much.